Dr. Jenna, thanks so much for taking the time today. No problem. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Listen, I'm looking forward to really talking and delving deep into all things immunity this morning. Uh, but maybe before we do that, you could give viewers and listeners a little whirlwind tour of your background. Yeah, so my background is uh, I kind of stumbled into the field of immunology because I had this huge interest as a child about what's the human body, why it goes wrong, what keeps us healthy. And uh, immunology just seemed to encompass all that. It was kind of the exploration of, uh, of our wellness system, if you like. So that was over 20 years ago now. And then I've sort of navigated my way in different fields following my interest, um, worked in allergic disease. I lived in Switzerland for about eight years working in sort of gut health, microbiome, immune system. And then the last sort of four or five years, I've been back in the UK um, and kind of just put feelers into different areas of, of lifestyle uh, and the immune system and diet to reflect kind of my personal interests as well. Incredible. Listen, I guess to get everybody on the same page in terms of the immune system, maybe you could give us, again, a little background on what the innate versus adaptive immune systems are and what they're doing for us. Yeah, that's a good place to start. Um, we often talk about the immune system like it's one thing that we want to switch on and off, like a binary uh, switch, but actually it's not really one thing. I teach to undergraduates at the uh, local university where I live and we teach that it's not just the white blood cells that are swimming around in your blood, but it's also the body barriers that are part of your immune system. So that includes your skin, your respiratory tract, the genital urinary tract, the digestive tract. All of these surfaces are in contact with our environment. So that represents the kind of first point of call with potential infection or damage or injury. So those are parts of our immune system too. And on those surfaces live our microbiota. So the collection of microbes that live on us and in us and, and as an immune we consider that those part of our immune defenses they keep these barrier areas strong and that's kind of the first part of what we call the innate immune system which is this first line defense underneath these barrier surfaces you have lots of innate immune cells so these are white blood cells that are very much first line defense anything that penetrates those barriers tries to infect those barriers these cells are waiting they're going to raise a red flag call for backup start off that inflammation process to to deal with that threat and then we have the more specific adaptive immune system which is comprised of our t and b cells these are recirculating around your body all the time they're sort of performing a surveillance function and when the innate immune system is activated they will take that signal of whatever the threat is. They will transmit it to the local lymph node. And we have lymph nodes all over our body. These are little hubs of immune activity. And here they will try and find a T or B cell that recognizes that specific uh, germ or threat. We call it an antigen. So the sort of molecular pattern on that microbe. Uh, and it's kind of like a lock and key that will switch on the T cells. They start to build an army of themselves and they're very, very specific. So that T cell response, that B cell response of the adaptive immune system, that's really specific for that particular germ that's infected you at that point. Um, and normally the immune system will deal with things, but sometimes it's not enough. So they have to call on this T and B cell response from the adaptive immune system. And that uh, the sort of unique a feature of the adaptive immune system is the fact that it can remember germs. We'll keep small populations of these, what we call memory T and B cells for, for decades, and they can then mount a, a more effective and quicker response the next time you encounter that germ. Yeah, it's an amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, to have the, the first line of defense, the sort of soldiers manning the wall, if you will, being yeah. able to protect us from all the, you know, as we get into fall, the, the seasonal colds exactly. and flus, which might come back a little bit more this year, we'll, yeah. we'll touch on. And then, yeah, the idea of memory is, is incredible, isn't it? I mean, to be to have the chicken pox when you're young and then years later being able to mount an immune response to have this memory to it is, is tremendous. Now, in terms of the immune system, though, there are a lot of myths that, that circulate yeah. online and on social media. And, and wanted to pick your brain on what are some of the common ones that you, you hear? Yeah, so I um, probably hear a lot about how we can boost our immune system. And I kind of get in trouble if I was to ever use the word boost by my colleagues, because 
you know, scientifically, there's no way that you can boost your immune system except for maybe giving a booster shot to boost the response to a particular vaccine, for example. That would be kind of the only correct way to use that term. And I do think that the immune system is about balance because as much as we, you know, we want to turn it on and, and mount an immune response when there's a threat that needs dealing with, we have a lot of our immune system that's designed to turn it off again. So half of the immune system is turning off the other half because if you let it run free uh, and that inflammation is going wild or the immune response is overshooting, then you risk damaging your own tissues because immune responses are inherently quite violent because they're trying to get rid of bacteria or viruses or parasites. So um, it's really about balance. Um, I think there's also a lot of emphasis put on the role of diet and lifestyle. And I'm sure we'll get into some of those ways yeah. that we can care for our immune system through that. But I think that, you know, there's lots of things we cannot control about our immune response. And I think we need to remember that there's a sort of limit to what we can influence. Well, I was going to say, um, even just touching on that idea of signaling with the immune system is so key because yeah. yeah, it's almost sometimes the analogy I use with clients is like, it's nice to have the green lights, the traffic signals on the way into work and you know, get there real quick. But if we made all the lights green <laughs> then it would be yes. a disaster because everyone exactly. would be running into each other, you know, we need to have the appropriate amount of signaling to get yeah. the job done. And uh, to your point, we obviously things like exercise help, which we'll talk about and then, um, you know, nutrition, but up to a certain point. And yeah. Any other myths that come, come to mind? Uh, that you catch a cold by being cold, mm. <laughs> which going into winter or uh, many of us might have remember our parents saying, if you go outside with wet hair in the winter um, and you can only catch a cold by coming in contact with the cold virus, whether you're cold or not, in some ways getting cold might be actually quite good for your immune system. Like a lot of people where I live in Brighton jump in the sea in winter. Yeah. Um, and this is associated with better immune response. So well, it's good to know because growing up in Canada, that was always the one, you know, oh, really? <laughs> watch you don't get too cold, you're gonna catch a cold. So <laughs> good to know on that side front. And well, listen, as we dovetail into this fall and winter season, we've obviously come off the pandemic and yeah. We've seen throughout the pandemic that unfortunately people who are more overweight or struggling with metabolic health, their immunity is 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 not to the same degree as someone else necessarily. And of yeah. course, there are genetic components, which we'll touch on. Can you talk a little bit about those factors of, of what influences us when we're not in our best health or if we're holding on to too much weight or there's more central adiposity? How does that all impact our immune system? Yeah, I think this is a really fascinating area and particularly an area that's been growing. We have the it's sort of a immunometabolism, it's called, which is the study of, of how our metabolic health is interlinked to our immune health. And I think it kind of makes sense because, you know, when you have a fever, we see that your resting metabolic rate will increase by 10% for every one degree rise in temperature that your body goes under. And that's telling us that things that your immune system are producing when they're fighting an infection to cause the fever are, are directly impacting your me metabolism. So we know that there's this very clear link between the immune system and, and the metabolic rate of your body. So it kind of makes sense because you have to fuel that immune response. So if we look at the sort of features of metabolism, we now know that both muscle and fat are immunologically active tissues. So we used to kind of think that fat was just a, a storage tissue so it's where you're putting your excess, it's just, uh, just there <laughs> energy. yeah it's in there it's just there but it's actually home to a lot of immune cells it's producing things that can influence the overall balance of the immune system so-called adipokines mm -hmm. um, and depending on how much and what type of fat you have on your body it can have quite a dramatic influence in this immune balance that we mentioned, the sort of balance between switching it on and switching it off. And obviously when we're healthy and well and we're not dealing with an infection, we want to have our immune response switched off um, so that we can reserve it for when we do need to fight an infection. So if we have a situation where we're cons over consuming calories, we're having to stuff that energy somewhere and it goes into our fat cells um, this is obviously simplifying it quite yeah, dramatically, yeah, no, right. <laughs> but, you know, we have, um, there's a theory that we have a sort of certain number of fat cells in our body. Mm -hmm. And so when you have an excess of calories, you're stuffing it into your fat cells and they're getting bigger and getting a bit stressed. 
um, and they're giving out these inflammatory signals, this kind of, uh, these adipokines, which is raising the baseline of inflammation in your body. Inflammation is quite damaging to tissues because it's meant as a sort of weapon against um, any threats to our body. And so having this raised baseline inflammation is something that we see in people who are carrying um, a higher amount of body fat, particularly the visceral adiposity, the the, the fat around the middle mm -hmm. and around the organs. And on the other side of that, you have muscle mass, which is um, kind of countering the unwanted inflammation. So um, having a degree of muscle mass is more of an anti-inflammatory. It's also helping your body deal with things like glucose effectively. And we know that having a good uh, blood sugar regulation is also really important for the immune system if you have sugar hanging out in your blood for too long this can sort of deregulate the function of your immune cells and cause them to go to go a bit awry so it's all kind of um in the in your sort of body composition and i know we we often use bmi as an easy metric to to look at people's weight but i think the composition of your body is probably much more telling to your immune health. So um, what is the fat mass and what is the muscle mass that a person has and using that as a guide to then make improvements. I mean, it's a great conversation to be having, obviously, to obviously on the immune front, but also to shift the conversation away from it always becomes an aesthetics conversation when we talk about body composition. It becomes where we're losing weight to look good for holiday or because someone's getting married or because we have a whatever exactly. it might be. Yeah. But this, this conversation around these, you know, the adipokines, the, the inflammation, this chronic inflammation that they're creating. And, and to your point, as we as that noise, that inflammatory noise starts to raise up in the body, then we're drowning out some of those key signals that the immune system is trying to make. And now we're not able to exactly. uh, you know, fight off infections as well, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, just having that raised level of inflammation in the body, having a, an impact on your metabolism, because we know that the, the signaling molecules involved in inflammation are, 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 affecting your metabolism like when you get a fever you have this direct effect so there's all this kind of negative feedback going on and um, we know that having a higher amount of body fat is preventing the production of sort of fresh new immune cells from your bone marrow and these are going to replace the, the older more defunct ones mm -hmm. so it's kind of keeping your immune system young if you like the sort of rejuvenation um, we know that exercise is a way to sort of kill off the old cells that are on their way out to make space for the new ones. So that's why, you know, you need to have this sort of good body composition and be moving your body. We know that uh, people who have a higher body weight have a reduced response to infection, a reduced response to vaccines, and it raises risks for other uh, non-infectious inflammatory diseases. So type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and it can exacerbate other conditions that people might be suffering from allergies, autoimmune diseases. So it's really kind of underscoring a lot of the, the health issues that we see in public health at the moment, this uh, careful balance of the immune system that's so easily knocked out by, you know, shifts in, in what, how much we're eating and how much we're moving and ensuring that we, you know, before we get into all the details of what to eat for your immune system, just are you over consuming calories and are you spending a lot of time being sedentary even if you're physically active and you go to the gym but if you spend eight hours a day sitting that's a sort of separate risk factor in itself for um poor metabolic health i like the comment that you make there around keeping your immune system young i feel like that's a really nice way to put it for people and um you know that idea of movement and exercise being able to clear these cells because obviously you know we hear a lot about fasting but we can almost go so far down that road of fasting that it becomes we almost forget about exercise yeah. because if we can keep a certain level of fitness we can do a lot of that get a lot of that benefit and, yeah um i imagine that you you know during the, the lockdown we obviously had what 18 months where it didn't seem like we had enough messaging maybe from you know government and other institutions to say hey let's let's eat a certain way or let's try to move a little bit more all these things you know to the messages that you're saying here actually have a really yeah. powerful powerful impact on our immune system I know. I, I think it's real a real shame. And I think in some ways that has sort of fueled the divide that we see with them, um, how people have responded to the COVID pandemic. And you have some people who are, it's all, all about diet and exercise. And then some people are like, I've got the vaccine, it's enough. Um, and it's a real shame that it's like that because um, there's a, a place for all of these in our overall health picture. Vaccines have their place. 
so does diet and exercise and you know particularly your comment to immune aging you know that is the single biggest risk factor for um, a more severe outcome with COVID and what I find mind-blowing is that you, you know your chronological age doesn't necessarily match your immunological age and there's these beautiful studies done by Professor Janet Lord University of Birmingham, where they looked at the thymus gland, which is a gland in the neck that's responsible for producing T cells. I kind of think of the T cells as kind of the master controllers of the immune system. They can turn into many different flavors. They can be regulators of the immune system. And as we get older, our thymus gland starts to shrink and its output of fresh new T cells will decrease. So how quickly that shrinking happens depends on how physically active you are. So they compared sedentary 20 somethings with um, very active 70 and 80 somethings. So these were cyclists and older people who had been consistently physically active through their life. And what they found is that, that, that they maintain so much more muscle mass that the older athletes mm. or recreational athletes moving their muscles regularly produce what they call myokines. So these cytokines, signaling molecules from the muscles that rejuvenated the thymus gland and kept it young, wow. kept the thymic output up, that their immune system was vastly improved compared to the sedentary 20 somethings who were not um, working those muscles and, and keeping that muscle mass. And, and going back to your point about, you know, losing weight for aesthetics, I, as you know, a woman in my forties, I think we, I grew up in that era of like you, you work out to burn calories to look a certain way and and I see a lot of women in, in my age bracket who are just cardio 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 it's like burning off the calories and I just think no let's let's do the resistance training you know in the government guidance in the UK we should be doing two rounds of resistance training per week and that just means like putting resistance on your muscles and you know, I think that's maybe changing now for younger generations but people are scared of lifting weights uh, women uh, of certain age groups i think they've never done it and it's uh a bit intimidating um, yeah intimidating they don't know what to do going into a gym and and it doesn't necessarily have to be weightlifting but you you have to look after your muscle mass as you age you know sarcopenia which is the sort of shrinking of muscles is accelerating every decade that we get older and if you don't use it you lose it effectively and now we know that's so key to underpinning keeping our immune system young there's even more reason that we want to look after that yeah again it's a powerful message to think that uh, our movement and just using our muscles in a dynamic way yeah you know improves immunity or supports immunity throughout our, our lives to the point where you're in the study that you're talking about we're getting similar or, or superior effects than yeah. even a 20 year old is sedentary um and yeah i mean i'm always amazed that you know unfortunately in sport we see or in the general population, we see people kind of hitting that middle zone yeah. of training and really burning out that kind of glycolytic. And they're, you know, we start to get so little bang for our buck. And now we yeah. start to tax the nervous system and the immune system. And so it's almost like we're really not, you know, maximizing our time in terms of how we can improve our health and our immunity. But uh, just wanted to circle back as we talked a bit about COVID-19. I know it's a bit of a, um, a minefield as we talked about these polar ends. And like any complex problem, I mean, it's not black or white. There's, there's all these shades of gray. And of course, who better to, to highlight some of that from the immune front than yourself? Um, so a couple of things I wanted to bring up. One of them was recently in the NHL, um, an unvaccinated player, unfortunately had caught COVID in the, in the summertime and then had developed in, in his mid to late 20s, uh, myocarditis. And so it spent some time away from the team. Now, you know, I've read that myocarditis is more, you're more likely to catch that from the actual um, COVID-19 infection than the actual vaccine. Of course, there's a lot of noise about that online. Could you yeah, tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, so uh, there seems to be a pattern emerging where young men uh, and boys are more at risk for this sort of adverse cardiac event known as myocarditis. Um, there was a preprint that came out of, I think, Israel, which looked at or maybe, maybe it was from the US VAERS data where they yeah. were taking the, the self-reporting adverse event data and showing that it was much higher post-vaccination than infection. Um, and I think this has been jumped on by a lot of people who are not for the vaccine as a sort of way to say, look, it's much worse with the vaccine. But this is a preprint and the VAERS data is 
is not really what we should be using to understand this risk because it's not um it, it's just a monitoring system so there's lots of reporting bias recall bias um it's used as a way to kind of generate hypothesis that we look at it shouldn't mm-hmm. be used as a way to tell us if there is a natural risk or not so that's definitely been taken out of proportion and i think that the risk with with infection i imagine would come out as being greater than with the the vaccine and there's sort of a few reasons for that you know vaccines are not without their risk at all i don't think anybody can be saying that but they are triggering the immune system in a, a very controlled way i think particularly with the new uh, formulations of vaccines that we're seeing um with SARS-CoV-2 and um, in that they don't have to contain some of these um, adjuvants that older v- vaccines contained which we know can sometimes be problematic for the immune response i think that you know it, it's you're giving a very controlled piece of that infection and your immune system's just responding to that when you receive the actual virus your body's chopping up that virus into lots of little bits presenting all of it to the immune system um some of that's going to mount a productive immune response and some of that won't and what your body cho- chooses to react to can be really different person to person because we have this genetic kind of variation in fact the genes that make us most different are not the genes that are defining our hair color or skin color or these kind of physical features that make us look different but actually it's the genes that encode for these human leukocyte antigen the HLA molecules of the immune system and these are important for turning on your T cells we all have different HLA molecules in our body we inherit them from our parents but recombine in a very unique fashion that means we're genetically and immunologically different from our parents even though we've inherited their genes more so than than the other uh, genes that we inherit it's a very kind of unique system it's quite hard to get your head around it's quite complicated i was going to say i mean it's a fascinating area because it does highlight even in a very you know it's obviously very complex but in a simple way this idea of the vaccine providing just a few fragments of this virus you know almost <laughs> going to use our exercise analogy like building your way up to being having the full load exactly. of an actual virus which has all the fragments and yeah. To your to your point here, we don't even know which fragments we might be responding to, and that's largely driven by genetics and not what we're eating or how we're moving. Exactly, uh, and you know, you give me the the virus, and we give you the virus, and we look at our um, T cells and our B cells and our antibody response. Um, we would not have an identical response to that virus. You could follow it day by day in the days following the infection, and our the time course the intensity the um specificity of our t cell response and our b cell response would be different we might both clear the infection but we might do it on a slightly different time frame and that kind of reflects this diversity in these human leukocyte antigen these hla molecules because if we all responded the same to every infection we would die out as a species you know there's always been an inherent variability in how well we we respond to an infection we've seen this with many other infections but it's been so heavily scrutinized with SARS-CoV-2 that it it just i know it, it's got a bit kind of confusing almost um and people are like why are some people asymptomatic do they have a superior immune system and why are some people getting really sick even though they're sort of young and healthy and it, there may be bits of diet and lifestyle in there but there's also this inherent diversity in these immune system genes whereby some people um they just can present that virus to the t cells very effectively they present the right parts the right targets and your body deals with it very effectively and other people they're genetic profile means they present the less effective bits of that virus to their t cells so the t cells have to work 10 times harder to 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 clear the infection it takes longer you know and i think that's something that's not really been discussed enough with the current pandemic you know that, that this is quite normal that you see this variation of course you know your lifestyle your diet plays a role but there's there's a kind of fundamental variation anyway Yeah, I mean it's amazing how we sort of latch on to these black and again these black and white type things and a really complex problem to try to understand it especially in you know in the general population and this really just highlights you know the, the layers that are happening yeah. here. Um, exactly. 
absolutely we want diet and exercise and lifestyle and, and stress which we'll talk about in a minute um but there's yeah. also these other components that are just going to be the, the cards that were dealt so to speak right yeah yeah for sure and i think that's what makes the immune system kind of frustrating in a way because it is really challenging to unpick all these layers and layers um a lot of the discussion now is about the impact of being us all being locked up for you know 20 months however long since the pandemic started yeah. and how this has created some immunity debt our immune system's been impacted by you know <laughs> lockdowns we're not going to survive the winter winter's coming exactly <laughs> i know like well there's a few things happening being locked up means the natural pattern of seasonal infections is a bit messed up because we were not um spreading them around in the normal way so, inside and all these types of things exactly. we do in the winter so then as soon as we start all going outside and back to our day daily life you will see a different pattern in infections you know maybe some of the winter viruses are happening earlier in a more concentrated fashion um in terms of our immune system from being locked up i mean the question is what did you do while you were locked up <laughs> that's like Net the, netflix red wine and ice cream <laughs> exactly <laughs> were you just sitting, yeah sitting on your sofa you were eating ice cream getting takeaway delivered you were maybe stressed because of affecting your work or your income or you mm -hmm. know lonely if you didn't have uh, ability to to um, have contact with people you know all of these factors for sure take their toll on your immune system um my personal experience was different. I got to spend loads more time with my family. I didn't have to commute, which was lovely. Um, we went outside as much as possible. Uh, we were able to be much more active. I had more time to work out because I wasn't commuting, even though the gym was closed. Nice. So, you know, my experience was very different to someone else's. And we don't necessarily need to be exposed to viruses that make us sick to have a strong immune system. In fact, most respiratory viruses like the coughs and colds that are common in winter, our immunity wanes quite quickly to these viruses and the viruses change, they, they drift in terms of their genetics. Mm -hmm. So we, we, you know, our memory to that virus won't be effective because another one comes along that looks slightly different. There's over 200 different cold viruses. So you get exposed to one, you get immune memory to that one. Chances are you never see that one again in your life because there's so many other ones. Yeah. And by the time you do see it again in 10 years time, your memories wanes because the location of where an infection takes place really affects how strong your memory response is. Okay. And I think this, the, the kinetics, the mechanics of immune memory are probably where um, the field is, is less mature. We, we really don't understand very much about how long a memory lasts for, what are the sort of inputs that are needed to get durable immune memory and this has been a huge discussion with covid because we've had this brand new infection and we can sort of follow it month by month and say how long is this immunity lasting for but then you have a, an infection in the blood like chickenpox because the location is different in the blood it seems to last for a lifetime yeah. but other areas like the gut and the lungs these are generally areas of immune tolerance because they're exposed to the environment all the time. You don't want to be mounting. You can't react to everything else. You'd be in big trouble. Yeah. You would damage your lungs. You know, you, you it's that trade-off in the immune system. There's constantly a sort of trade-off. So we don't tend to get really durable immune responses from the infections that inhabit our respiratory tract anyway. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't imagine that SARS-CoV-2 infection would give you really long durable immunity. Time will tell because every year we can measure, you know, and see how long that lasts. But vaccines, again, you're giving it in a very controlled way. So you have more ability to sort of manipulate and give the right signals to get yeah. durable immunity. Tremendous. Well, I mean, we've talked all about the exercise component and obviously aerobic fitness and importance of muscle mass and maintaining body composition and how these things aren't just aesthetics. This is really key for our immune system. Let's now, you know, pivot and talk about nutrition for immunity. You know, yeah. what are some of the main foods that, that we should be thinking about as we move into fall, whether it's supporting COVID or just immunity in general? Exactly. I think this is probably where I have like a real personal passion. So it's something that I've personally been uh, interested in and it's reflected in sort of my professional area so as much as you know we've discussed things like vaccines and things we can't control I do think nutrition plays a huge role um, there's a few things I think are important to sort of say 
before you get into the sort of real details. Mm-hmm. I think having a good relationship with food is so important because food is so much more than nutrition. It's cultural, it's social, and it it, it family, friends, be, laughing, all that good yeah, stuff. Right? It supports our our mental well being because it can be you know just nostalgia, meeting with friends, but we can use it as a coping mechanism. And I think that if food is your only coping mechanism, you need to have other coping mechanisms in place you need to develop those build up that repertoire exactly um and the other thing is that you know through my own personal interest what is the the perfect diet for the immune system um and i think that there is no perfect there is your overall dietary pattern trumps uh, a focus on individual nutrients all the time you know for a long time the field of immunology was just looking at vitamin c zinc you know these individual micronutrients and it was to me it's kind of boring and outdated i just think diet pattern is more important what are you eating across the weeks and months habitually are you hitting all those key targets for micronutrients so you don't want to be deficient in any essential vitamin or mineral not just vitamin c or zinc but vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, K, zinc, selenium, iron, any deficiency in those will affect your immune function. And generally, apart from vitamin D, we can get those from eating a a varied and healthy balanced dietary pattern. If you're excluding specific food groups, then you may need targeted supplementation. If you're suffering with a specific condition, then you may need targeted supplementation. But I'm kind of like the supplements are there to supplement gaps in your diet, not to replace it. Like my husband will be like, oh, I'm taking a multivitamin today because yesterday (laughs) I ate really badly. Or that insurance policy coming in. Exactly. (laughs) It's like it doesn't quite work like that because food has something that we cannot really get in supplements that is so important for our immune system. And that is the phytonutrients, these Mm -hmm. plant compounds that are found in in, in plant foods that um, have antioxidant potential, antimicrobial potential, the kind of longevity nutrients. They keep our immune system young. They turn on um, genes involved in, in longevity. They turn off unwanted inflammation. You know, you're talking polyphenols, um, things like curcumin, um, resveratrol, uh, you know, the ones that are very well studied. Turns out there's almost 30,000 different phytonutrients that have been identified. They're working synergistically. Um, There's lots of attempts to put them into... um, Capsule. Get those 200 compounds from ginger into one. (laughs) Exactly. And um, a friend of mine who works in the US was was involved in testing different supplements to look at the, the activity of the phytonutrients inside. And it turns out that this varies hugely on the market. So you might be spending a lot of money and you're not getting... Uh, what you think is in there because it's quite hard to encapsulate that what nature is put together often it's it's the chewing or the eating with other foods or the consumption with other foods that it's having that synergistic effect and making chemical reactions that make these things bioavailable so I think that you know you cannot rely on getting that from a supplement there's nothing quite like getting it from food and food is conveniently packaged with fiber um, and fiber is feeding the microbes in your gut. That's their preferred food. So eat, eat for your gut bugs because they're the kind of key educators and trainers of your immune system. So this is happening right from birth when we begin to be colonized with these microbes. And there's you know over 70% of your immune system along, along the gut. And it's kind of a real area of immune tolerance. So training your immune system not to respond to things um, unnecessarily. So preventing allergies, um, inflammatory diseases, and controlling how well we respond to infections without overshooting. So, And that's a really interesting area too, isn't it, when kids, because we've seen studies with like kids who are in more rural children who are exposed to dirt and farms and things, and then the less yeah. overactivation they might have versus sometimes in the, in the urban environments, those rates might be a little higher of, of immune exactly. overactivation. Yeah, I mean, if you consider we're sort of relatively sterile in utero, and then when we come out, we, we get exposed to whatever's in our environment. 
um, breast milk uh, contains certain fibers that are designed not to feed the baby and it did confuse scientists for a long time like oh, these human milk oligosaccharides why, why are What's they in breast milk? <laughs> the baby's not getting any nutrition from these but they're cultivating the right types of microbes in the gut it's like a fertilizer so um it, it's providing the food to really cultivate this diverse gut microbiome that we need and then uh as we you know start eating that's also having an effect on our microbiome exposure and going back to your point with um the the rural kids versus the city kids i think this was back in the 80s with um this chap called strachan who's famous for um the hygiene hypothesis mm -hmm. which has kind of been replaced uh, and, and updated with the biodiversity hypothesis because I think hygiene hypothesis makes us think that we have to be really hygienic and it, it's 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 dirt is good. Mm -hmm. It's not about infections. It, it, hygiene is important. Washing your hands after the bathroom when, before you eat food. It's more about the biodiversity in your environment that is important. And if we um, reduce that through over sanitizing, not getting enough exposure to green environments, then we're not giving our immune system those inputs from those good bacteria because if you consider everything that you touch and breathe is filled with bacteria you want to be in the environments with the good ones which is generally the green natural environment so you can breathe and nurture your gut microbiome which i think is something that's not really uh, appreciated Definitely not. And I'm going to circle back to this as we get to the end, because some interesting comments that I've heard you make about that as well. Um, but coming back to food, and if we look at different colors of food, is this something that we should be thinking about? Like the, obviously the orange colors, we're thinking beta carotene, vitamin A, what are some of the foods that you like to have on your plate or your client's plate as you get into the winter? Oh, yes, definitely. So the orange, like you say, the beta carotene, the vitamin A, it's known as the anti-infective vitamin. And you can also get it from animal foods. So liver is like a really rich mm. source of active form of vitamin A. But and you those, can hide the liver really well in like ground beef exactly. and <laughs> chilies, <laughs> bolognese. Okay. Yeah, I do this a lot with, with my kids. Um, coming into autumn, we get loads of the seasonal produce and there's actually some evidence that eating seasonally whether you live somewhere like the UK where we are or whether you live in the country where you have a rainy and a dry season that the produce that's growing at that time supports your immune system for the type of infections that are associated with those conditions in the colder seasons we get more of these respiratory viruses because they like the cooler climate so all the the reds and oranges get those into your diet make some really hearty curries stews these sorts of things combine them with things like lentils if people do eat meat why not take away half the meat and put in a plant-based protein source because that's bringing in fiber the animal Based protein sources bringing in other key nutrients like B12. Um, leafy greens is my, my personal favorite because I think generally we're not eating enough of them. And they have these sulfur rich compounds in them, which are really important for longevity, gene patterns that we want to switch on, um, really important for immune regulation and providing so many uh, of these sort of key phytonutrients that uh, are really good for the overall balance of the immune system and getting enough protein is actually quite important protein energy malnutrition is probably the biggest factor causing immune deficiency worldwide i think here in the uk we have access to plenty of different protein sources but i speak to many people who've sort of reduced meat consumption and haven't maybe brought in those plant-rich protein sources to replace them and again going back to what we said about getting older and maintaining muscle mass having that um, pool of those amino acids, those building blocks from dietary protein is really important to help your body sort of hang on to that muscle mass too. hundred percent. And what about some of the ancestral things, you know, when we think of chicken soup, you know, from a, yes, yeah. from a science standpoint, I mean, these soups, you know, we feel like they're reducing congestion or bringing yeah. on board some nutrients. Where, but where are we at in terms of yeah. is the placebo effect enough? I mean, I like the placebo effect. I'll take any yeah. effect I can get. Me too. I'm a fan of the placebo effect. It's feeling good. And, you know, particularly in winter, we want to have a bit of agency over our health. So sometimes it can make us feel like we're being proactive, which can then make us feel better. Uh, and that's, you know, that access between the brain and the immune system is very real. 
Um, but yeah, chicken soup has L carnosine, which is coming from the, the chicken stock. And this has been shown to actually help these white blood cells move into the location where they're needed. So if you have a respiratory infection to get in there, help with dealing with that infection. Plus it's hydrating, it's comforting. You can add all those lovely orange veggies in there and you can add loads of leafy greens in there and the heat and the steam can help relieve some of that mucus and nasal congestion to get things flowing. And, and it's kind of like a hug in a mug. You feel better having it. So, so yeah, there's definitely science behind the chicken yes. soup idea. <laughs> keep those stews and soups going for the fall. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if we just touch on supplementation, I mean, if we feel like we're coming down with something versus acutely sick, are there different strategies there or perhaps some go-tos yeah. that you like to use? Well, I, I guess I, I like to focus on the diet pattern and the kind of food first approach as your baseline. The one thing I didn't mention was vitamin D, which if you live somewhere like the UK in the winter, you're not probably going to get enough from sun. Sunlight has many other benefits on the immune system. So getting outdoors is important, getting in the mm. fresh air. But um, it is advisable to either have your vitamin D levels checked or start supplementing in October until uh, April. If you're someone who's indoors a lot, has darker skin or is older, you might want to be supplementing all year round. Yep. Um, and then when you do get sick, I kind of like to keep my little um, cupboard in the kitchen with some things that I can pull out to make me feel better quicker. Um, what I don't do is take all the over-the-counter medicines from the pharmacy because generally they, they might make you feel better and you can go to work and you can function, but they're suppressing the immune system in order to make you feel better. So that might be something that you want to do if you really have to be at work or you've got a big deadline, but actually the best thing you can do is just stop and take a day to rest because having one or two days to recover will get you back on your feet quicker than just trying to show up to work and we have that sort of culture of presenteeism where we want to go to work show that we're there even though we've got this cold and we're sneezing everywhere and we're spreading our germs on the bus on our commute to our colleagues if so there's, it's one, there's one thing covid's taught us is that people aren't People aren't a fan of that anymore. Exactly. <laughs> Stay home if you're not well. <laughs> it's definitely uh, given that whole coughs and sneezes, spread diseases, a revamp, like, yes, yeah. yeah, stay away, stay home. And then I have, you know, um, the things that I would pull out when I was feeling sick, um, things like zinc and zinc ionophores. So this would mm -hmm. be quercetin, yep. which is the compound found in plants, which helps zinc get into the cells and do its best. So if you combine those two, there's some mm -hmm. evidence that, that can help your immune system because your requirement for zinc goes up quite a lot. Yep. Um, vitamin C, there's a little bit of evidence that might shorten the duration of infection if you get sick. Um, I like to take it with the bioflavonoids. So these are these phytonutrients found in citrus plants. You can get supplements where they sort of combine it um, or just having lots of citrus fruits around the time you get sick. Um, making sure you have your chicken soup or something where you've got a protein source because you might not feel much like eating, but the protein's probably the one to prioritize because that's giving the building blocks to um, all those antibodies and cells that your body's producing. And if you're sick for quite a long time, you want to try and hang on to that muscle mass. So it's important to prioritize protein. Then there's garlic, ginger, turmeric. You know, these are all really great. Lots of antimicrobial properties, anti-inflammatory properties. Lactoferrin is something that there's a bit of um, buzz about at the moment. Um, so it's protein that we make naturally uh, and it's secreted on those body barriers like in, in the mouth and the airways uh, and it's antimicrobial. It's also enriched in breast milk. And now they found a way to extract this from various sources and put it into a supplement. So you can, it's suck on a lozenge that has lactoferrin, um, which will help sort of coat the throat and, and create that sort of antimicrobial environment. So um, there's lots of good solutions there. So to get the medicine cabinet ready to be able to have those things on, on hand yeah. that you can use if you are feeling run down or you're catching a cold. And then all the yeah. things that you mentioned around the herbs and spices that we can use in soups and stews and smoothies, sure. um, yeah. getting those foods in is so key. But I wanted to come back to as well as we as we wrap up here, um, the mental side of things. Yes. Yeah. We talked about COVID and lockdown and even just, you know, for myself coming down to an area where you can see out for, for quite a ways, you know, over, over the water, you're getting outdoor into nature. Yeah. Again, this it feels like almost it's a placebo effect of just being able to feel better, but you all of a sudden feel more robust. 
you know, what is this impact of even just getting outside into nature having on our immune system? Yeah, I think it's so multifaceted and so just awe-inspiring because you know as I mentioned there's the microbiome element you're breathing your biome the natural environment is full of good bugs that we want to colonize to inhale to to have exposure to there's also the, the sort of uh, the link between our um, stress chemistry and being in the outdoors you know when we're sitting at our desk we're very stressed we've got this kind of laser focus our eyes have got this very narrow gaze um, and then you get up and you go for a walk and you have a, a more um, panoramic gaze your the muscles around your eyes are relaxing it's sending that signal to your brain that you're relaxed you're in a safe environment um and that in itself um calms any of this uh sympathetic nervous system activity the stress chemistry which we know can dampen our immune responses and so many of us have these lives that are full of little stressors um and then big bigger stressors like covid job security, you know, this kind of thing that we... I've got three little stressors at home. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you on that. You know, we all need to... We live in a society where there's so much, so many layers of stress that we might not even be aware of that sort of grinding us down, that we need to take those opportunities. And, and being in green space has been shown to calm the stress chemistry in our body. Um, there's also things that, that are produced by trees, by plants. So these aromatic compounds, phytoncides, which there are some beautiful studies in Japan around the sort of forest bathing idea that when we breathe them in, this triggers pathways in our body that, that nurture the activity and the function of natural killer cells these are a type of wow. immune cell involved in antiviral responses and they're also our anti-cancer defense so the sort of first line cancer defense and they show that this is uh, by these compounds and they put people in rooms and then they give them the smell in the room they can get a similar benefit so it's not just about being in nature but it's actually sort of being drilled down to the, these aromatic compounds from trees so i just think you know combining things like movement by getting out for a walk in nature that can just make such a difference to your day if you're having a really intense day if your job is quite sedentary um you know and it's nurturing your well-being on all different levels yeah i mean it's tremendous to think that just getting outside into nature or getting the stress response getting these compounds that you're talking about with just being exposed to nature and so yeah. you know as best you can even if you're in an urban environment try to find that yeah. local park or an area that you can, exactly. you can do these things it is having just a profound effect uh, nervous system immune system all these things and exactly you know the, the last note here is just on this idea we're talking about mindset and emotions and pandemic and immune system how do things like self-compassion even connect with the immune system right how is that something that we should be thinking about even coming off of covid and as we move into fall that can actually help us in a number of ways Oh, that's so important. And it's something I'm quite passionate about, probably because it wasn't something I was ever really formally taught as a child, but I think it would have been very useful to me. And I wish it is taught in schools now. But this idea of, of self-compassion, which is, um, you know, showing yourself kindness, doing things mindfully for yourself. There's actually a body of literature looking at uh, changes in immune function when people are taught sort of self-compassion techniques where they see improvements in how well their immune system is in getting rid of unwanted inflammation um, just by uh, the sort of nurturing self-compassion and I think you know as a busy working parent it's there's lots of things to feel bad about to feel guilty about to feel like not good enough about social media gives us that direct comparison second by second with with people um in, everyone's in, highlight reel <laughs> exactly you know uh, and that compare you, you you're more likely to compare up and say oh i don't have the same level of lifestyle as that person or i'm not eating this amazing uh clean diet that that person's eating and and just showing yourself some self-compassion is um you know good for your mental health but it's also really good for your immunological health and I think it gives you a good subjective sense of well-being uh, and we know from the literature that um if you have a sub good subjective sense of your own well-being that's kind of just a good sense of feeling feeling good even if you have a chronic condition or some awful diagnosis you have a much better chance of recovery, of healing. Um, you're better protected against 
developing chronic diseases. So I think that, you know, that comes down to sort of mental resilience, doesn't it? It's not uh, that subjective sense of well-being is something we can cultivate at that psychological level that's having a huge impact on our physical health, our risk of disease and our kind of long term health. Tremendous. Listen, I could I could pick your brain all day, but I know we've got to we've got to wrap things up. So you know, loads of great insights here. Uh, I'm sure people have to listen back to to be able to capture yeah. everything because that was that was tremendous. <laughs> but spoken really fast. No, Maybe no, that was fantastic. Part two and <laughs> well, where where can people stay connected with you? I mean, you got a fabulous book. It's actually just on my uh, nightstand there, getting ready for the fall in terms of the immune system. Where can people stay connected with you and keep up with your uh, tremendous work? Oh yeah, so I'm most active on Instagram. So I'm Dr. Dr underscore Jenna underscore Machoki, which is M-A-C-C-I-O-C-H-I. You can find me over on my website, which I try and keep updated. I also have a monthly newsletter that comes out. I'm also on Twitter, sometimes being a bit more of an academic over there. But yeah, always happy to hear from people. I have a book out. I'm trying to write a second one. (laughs) (laughs) Digging its toll, but uh, getting there. (laughs) Fantastic. We'll we'll definitely include all those links. And again, Dr. Jenna, thanks so much for, for taking the time today. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. 